pretty much we're going to give an overall view of the water distribution system um, that you would encounter. Um, and then we're going to go over design on your specific site. All right, this is just kind of a easy diagram of a municipal system. You've got your water supply over here, which is going to come from a river or a lake um, or wells, and it, where they uh, pull out the groundwater and then treat it. So once it comes out of wherever the water supply is, goes in the reservoir. Then they've got the treatment plant where they treat the water, um, and from there, they've got pretty much two options. Um, they're either going to pump it or they're going to use a gravity system um, where they pump it up into some kind of holding tank and they use gravity to pressurize the system. Once it leaves that, the uh, tank comes through these mains uh, along all the roads and eventually to how those buildings service any kind of... Uh, any kind of building that needs water service. Um, so on, on your site, we're gonna we're gonna focus on pretty much these four items uh, when you're designing your site. The one one's gonna be that you have a loop system. Uh, anybody have any ideas why you'd want a loop system on your site? So if one side broke up, you still got water on it. Yeah, that's one reason. Yes. Well, okay, so that's a good point. Uh, repairs are, are uh, obviously going to be necessary at some point. So if you have a loop system, you can cut the line, and you're still going to provide pressure and water from the other other direction. Um, it's just Basically, a backup if anything happens, not even just repair, sometimes a water line breaks. Um, people hit, run into a uh, backflow that's above the ground, anything like that. So that's one reason. Another is just to, um, just to provide um, pressure, an equal, like an equalizing pressure. Um, or if you have a line that's kind of stopped on one end, a lot of times, it doesn't, if it doesn't get used, uh, then the water can go stale. Uh, so you don't want that either. So that's a couple reasons why they loop, why we loop the system. Um, the other thing we're going to talk about is valves. You're going to install valves uh, again for repairs mainly. Um, anywhere where there's a T that you'd install, um, you put a valve in. Anywhere where you're tapping an existing line, you're going to need a valve there in, in order to, um, to make the tap. Um, there's going to be valves on your backflow devices. Um, that's for maintenance when they you do testing and whatnot. So that's pretty much where you get the valves. Um, fire hydrants, that's for fire safety, uh, usually required. Uh, there's different circumstances when they're required, but in general, on our site, what we're going to do is we're going to require two fire hydrants on the site. Um, yeah, minimum. You guys, we can, we can do more, but a minimum of two when you're doing your design. Um, there's code as far, I think we require modeling of two, right? Modeling of two, but you actually have to space them based on Right, whatever based on the counting. counting criteria. So when you look that up, it will have spacing requirements and um, that varies by use as well. So um, just look into that. But we're only going to require that you model to them. So. What's the difference between a fire hydrant and just the, the fire department connections that have to be? Um, we have photos. Of, I yeah. Photos. Yeah. They not have like a, like pressure. Uh, actually, I don't have a photo of a fire department. Uh, FDC is actually connected directly into the building. Mm -hmm. And it provides extra power, extra pressure in the building to run the sprinklers that are in the building. So the fire truck will pull up, connect to the fire hydrant, connect another hose to the FDC, and then the fire truck is basically a giant pump. And the pump takes the water from the fire hydrant, 
forces it into the building at a much higher pressure so you can get much higher pressure out of the sprinkler system inside. We will draw a little diagram to see how that works and how you do backflow prevention and make sure you don't short circuit them later. But. Yeah. Um, there's also another uh, thing I'll show you later uh, called a post indicator valve that they install on fire lines too. Um, so the fire hydrants, pretty much as far as location, is going to be accessible to the fire department through fire trucks. Um, there are requirements as far as like how far behind the curve and that kind of thing you have to do, but in general, it's got to be accessible. Um, and then last is water services, and that's uh, that's kind of this picture here. The way the water services work, you've got your mains running along the uh, roadway. And every service is going to have, in general, every service is going to have a, a tap onto the main line it's called uh, a lateral. So you're going to have a service lateral or service line um, with a corporation shop stop, which is basically just a, a valve uh, below ground that you, won't, you don't ever see. And those pretty much stay open all the time once your roads are installed. And it'll come through here, then you'll have a curb stop, which is... A lot of times, if you open up a, a water meter valve, um, you see that little valve in there, that's a curb stop. Uh, this one's a little bit lower, below ground, but sometimes it'll be up here and it'll just be a meter box up here. And you'll have your meter, and then when it goes into the building. Uh, so that's, in general, that's the way a service line is looks underground. You're going to have these for any of your um, retail uses, any... Any of your apartments, they're gonna they're gonna have one service that can be separately metered or separate services. Kind of depends on however your client wants to do it. Uh, if you end up with a bigger meter, you get charged more based on the fee of the meter, but it's easier for them because they only get one bill. If you have a whole bunch of meters, then you know it depends on how they're billing the clients. But in general, we're just gonna say you need to provide service to each building, and you know, if you want to go any further, you can. But as long as you have your power or your water demands in your calculations, one per building. Okay, here's a picture of um, pretty much these are the valves that most typical valves that we see in our water design. Um, first one's a gate valve. Um, those are pretty much used on all the larger main lines. Uh, and the way that works is there's a screw here. And as you turn the top of this nut, and it, it lowers what a gate pretty much down. There's a, on both sides here, there's kind of a channel that rides in. It just slowly closes that. Um, any of the larger valves that you see are going to be that kind of, kind of valve. Um, the next one is a check valve and or a swing valve, and the way that works is there's like a uh, pin here and it swings and lets water come through it, and if there's any back pressure, it closes and doesn't allow it to come back through the, the valve. So those are what you see above ground, the backflow devices. There's usually one or two of those in there of some uh, shape or form. Uh, so that's another one we see a lot of. Um, next one is a post indicator valve, and uh, it's actually not a valve. Uh, this would go on top of a gate valve, and those those would get installed on um, on fire lines. They're kind of basically it's, it's what it is. It's, a, it's an indicator that on a post, and it'll say open or closed. And all it tells you is whether the valve's open or closed. But for some reason, the fire department guys, they like to see it say open or closed. So that's all that is. But you'll see them uh, around just whenever you're looking around. And I don't know, I kind of do it. So their backflow preventers also have like an additional line that runs around them, an additional check. Okay, those are that's a, um, a bypass meter. Um, so I don't, I don't think I have a picture of a. Well, we'll we'll see. I'll show a real bit of the backflow printers, and I'll, I'll go through that. Um, 
Let's see, the next one, that's what I was talking about. The curb stop is, um, that's the one you'll see in the meter box with the little T there. And see that little hole there? That's when they lock it when you don't pay your bill. Yeah, that's that one. And then this one's the one that they use at the connection um, when they tap into an existing water line. They'll uh, drill a hole and um, that's a compression fitting on that side and the thread fitting on the other. But that's the valve right there. It's pretty much the low valve. Um, that's pretty much the typical ones we see in there. These these are being the water services, and these are more in the main lines. Important too is those two, the gate yeah. valve and check valves, are those yeah. two most common valves you're going to see on the water system. Um, gate valves you just do when you want to be able to control whether the water can flow or not. Uh, check valves are important where you're wanting to make sure that the flow is only in one direction. You don't have a cost you know, where you would want to put flow is only in one direction. Which one? Like into a house, into a building. Yeah. Basically, anytime you go from a public system to a private system, what they're trying to prevent is, let's say you have people do weird things in their houses. Maybe you've got some sort of water hose hooked up to something that has not pure water, <coughs> and if there's ever say a drop in water pressure out in the public system. You could create a siphon effect where the public system is pulling water backwards from your system into the public system, which could cause some contamination if you had some nasty stuff in their bathtub. They could pull it back into the public water system and contaminate the entire system. Or another example is these fire, uh, uh, basically the sprinklers. They keep chemicals in these lines to keep them from rusting. Um, so if there's ever a backflow from the fire connection to the public system, you could pull in all those nasty chemicals from the sprinkler system into the public water supply. So anytime you have a connection from a public system to a private system, you have to have some sort of check valve to prevent water from flowing from the private system back into the public system. It's, it's a public safety issue. Or worst case is, you know, if there's actually somebody trying to do harm to the public system, you know, all they would have to do is pressurize a hose spigot or something and make it back pressure. Um, but that's the reason why you put it in. Okay. okay, so this, uh, this is kind of an overview of the height materials and strengths that we use in our designs. Um, the materials are based on a few different things, how deep the pipe's going, uh, what kind of soils are there, you know, whether there's some kind of corrosive materials uh, or water table is another one. Um, and uh, as part of that, how deep they are, you got to worry about what kind of traffic's are, you know, above it. So is it under a road or is it out in the middle of a field? Um, in general, we require, you know, three foot depth on water mains minimum uh, and then as far as the materials there's ductile iron, PVC, HDPE and PE and uh, those are polyvinyl chloride, high, de uh, high density polyethylene and polyethylene and those lines are pretty much used uh, the first three are fairly common in water mains um, PVC and ductile iron being the more common ones. HDPE is used more for uh, like directional drilling. Anytime, because the HDPE can be fused together, um, you don't need fittings for it. So they can make real long runs of pipe. Um, and they can, you know, I'll go through directional drilling and everything later, but uh, the HDPE one is. is Kind of like a niche um, use where you're not required to have the fitting, so you can put long runs and stuff. You, know, you don't have to open cut the, the uh, ground to put them in. So, uh, and then PE is pretty much used for smaller diameter pipes, more like a PVC, the smaller PVC schedule 40, um, used for water services. So I'll show you some pictures of that kind of stuff. Um, the ductile iron, these are just their classifications. Um, 
ductile iron has got a pressure and thickness class. PVC and HDPE use um, DR ratings like DR14 or DR18, um, DR25. So the lower the number, the less thick it is. Uh, sorry, the higher the number, the less thick it is. Um, PVC used the C900 for 12 inch, C905 for greater than 12 inch. Um, here's one that a lot of people kind of mess up every now and then is uh, PVC pipe is actually, it comes in colors. Um, most of the time when it's installed, it's installed based on the use. So if you ever see water uh, being installed, it's going to be a blue pipe. If you see sanitary sewer going in, that's going to be green pipe. And reclaimed water is purple. So um, I'll, I'll go over some other things that they use to identify those lines um, where they use tracing wire and tape, uh, some other types of things when contractors are digging it up. But a lot of times when they're digging, some of that stuff's not there, but that's one of the identifiers. So they can look at pipe and see. I know what that is. So. Um, but that's only in PVC. So a lot of the other ones, you see ductile iron. Most of the time it's water, but it could be used as a casing or something else. So, um, fittings are, in general, um, 90, 90 degrees, 45, 22 and a half, and 11 and a quarters. Um, those are pretty much any time you got to change in direction. Other, on, on a ductile iron or a PVC, um, the HDPE and the PE is pretty flexible, so a lot of times you don't have to use too many fittings for that kind of stuff, but um, the the first two pipes you're going to have to put in fittings, and those are the directions. So a lot of times when we're putting in plans, you know, we can't just draw angles all the way around the paper because it, it's tough to install it that way. Sometimes it doesn't get installed that way anyways, but in general, you try and give the contractor a good idea of where to install it, how to install it, um, so we stick with these type of directions. Um, 90 degrees you don't really want to use a whole lot on uh, sewer. On water it's okay, um, but again, on, on gravity systems, not so much. Pressurized systems, it's okay, but it's preferred to use 45 because you get some losses. Um, and you can also get some uh, hammer effects where you know, if there's a variation in pressure, uh, you know, some force at those 90s. So a lot of times, they've kind of gone away through it. They used to do um, thrust blocks where they would pour concrete at the joint, at the uh, fittings, and kind of restrain it. Um, they don't use that any, too much anymore. Um, now they have. Um, it what? Oh, yeah, and thrust block or collar, yeah, the same thing, but now they main brand for a restraint joint. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll show, I'll show it to you. So they, they use restraint joints or mega lugs um, for the joints, so it's mechanical joints versus the um, concrete. Um, oh, okay, and then right here is, we're talking about joints. Uh, these are the three main joints that when they're installed in the pipe, um, compression fittings, mechanical fittings, and flange fittings. And I'll kind of point those out in the pictures here on the next few slides. So that's a load of, anybody want to guess what kind of pipe that is? Ductile iron. Yeah, that's ductile iron pipe. Um, I don't know what else to say on that. Pipe. I'll just point out in case you're ever on the field for construction purposes. <laughs> Ductile iron has a bell end, which is that end, that end and then it has the, end. yes. See that yellow line that's on the other end? You no. know what the yellow line is for? Where the bell goes. Pardon? Where the bar you go. Exactly. That tells the contractor that you've driven it in far enough. If you connected the one end of the pipe to the bell end far enough, you won't see the yellow mark anymore. So. <laughs> That way you know it's seated properly. If you see the yellow still, they didn't seat it enough, you're probably going to have that pipe come apart. Is that all for uh, wastewater? This would be, uh, this is probably a water line, I guess. Um, just because of the size. 
Uh -huh. the, uh, the other thing is, as far as fittings go, on this one, they don't, sometimes they use joint restraints, but most of the time they use an internal restraint that goes inside that uh, bell, and it's got teeth. And it kind of locks in. Once it slides in, it grips it, and you can't pull it out. So taking out ductile iron pipes is usually a pain. Yeah, and cities will have different, or cities and counties will have different requirements. Ductile iron is more expensive, but it's generally speaking sure. going to hold up better, um, especially in heavy load areas. So like if you have a water line going up to, say, a truck uh, area in your building, say, where the trucks are going to be turning around or unloading, and unloading dumpsters, you probably want to go ahead and upsize or up class the pipe to make it ductile iron. Uh, the only time that could be a problem is if you've got uh, pH that would have a very aggressive soil type. Uh, it can actually eat away metal pipes very quickly. So you could use ductile iron, but you have to put a special coating on it or put cathodes into the ground to sort of direct the corrosion into the cathodes, which we've got pictures of that as well. So. So here's a picture, and this is a uh, pallet full of uh, fittings. And these are ductile iron fittings. These are, these would go on the uh, ductile iron pipe or, or the uh, PVC pipe. And you can see, oh, that's the easiest one. This right here is a uh, flange fitting. And... Uh, but basically, there's a rubber gasket that would go in here, and uh, basically a ring that goes on the outside that clamps it together, and as it pushes it into that uh, wedge, it kind of it forces the uh, rubber into the wedge, and it uh, seals it, and then you bolt it around the edges. Uh, I'll show you another picture of a valve. Those are, those are gate valves in there. A bunch of fire hydrants, a Florida Gator grad. There's a. Hydrants, there's always going to be a valve in front of your fire hydrant, and that's pretty much for maintenance. Uh, the fire hydrant is going to be exposed all the time, so it has a tendency to get backed into um, whatnot. They actually have a breakaway piece that goes on there that kind of helps it from damaging the rest of the line if somebody does back into it. Um, if you think about it, the that water system there is part of the public system. Mm -hmm. If this thing breaks off, you couldn't do a repair without cutting into the If you didn't have a valve there, you couldn't do a repair without cutting into the pipe and putting in a new section, which would potentially contaminate whole runs of line and make it very... Uh, in order to get to another valve to shut off water so it's not going through that system, you may be cutting off large sections of a neighborhood or a commercial development. So anytime you have something that's a natural hazard that's sticking up out of the ground, you want a valve right behind it so that if something does happen, say a car runs in and knocks the fire hydrant off, you can shut it off right there and do the repair fairly easily. Yep. Do, is that... So that's a gate valve, but is it a, is there also a check valve on there too? Um, no. no, no check valve. No, check valve. no. Okay. not on the fire system. Not on this portion of the fire system. There is uh, the way a fire hydrant works. There's a you know nut at the top of this, and there's pretty much a rod that runs all the way down, and then closes it down here. So I mean, it's uh, there's gonna be water in here for the most part, but. There's nothing keeping it from backfiring or backflowing. What do you do? Sorry, go ahead. No, nothing good. 
Yeah, this isn't typically the fire hydrants are going to be on the public system side, so you don't have the, the check valves at that point. But I was going to point out, you'll notice how all the underground metal portions there are wrapped in plastic. That's because this was an aggressive soil, and that was something to help protect the metal fitting uh, when it was installed. Yeah. Uh, you can see the pipes blue there. That's water. That's a gate valve that we were talking about earlier. All right, so this is that's some of that water line being installed with the duct iron pipe. That's the fitting that I was talking about, the mega lug. That uh, it's hard to see. These are the uh, wrenches they used to to screw the uh, bolts in, but it basically they're in two sides of the 45 and it compresses on both sides. That's what they use to restrain them now. So, well, But yeah, if you think about it, you've got the water, it's exerting a force through that pipe. It's wanting to run straight along the pipe, but you put a bend in it, so there's a resultant force that wants to continue going this way. And you need to do something to keep the pipe from falling apart and separating where you have that joint. And depending on the severity of the bend, you'll have to restrain further back. Um, and the size of the pipe. Yeah, it depends on the severity of the bend, the size of the pipe, and soil conditions. Um, so there's actually tables that you have to go through and do a set of plans, calculate the auto restrain joint table that tells the contractor for based on the soil conditions you anticipate on the site, the size of the pipe, and the bends, or the angle of the pipe, how far back you have to restrain from each uh, joint. And then they'll go in and do what he's doing, is put in these mega things, which basically pull the pipes together for a certain depth, or a certain distance from that bend to secure it. Does that make sense? That's pretty much another picture using PVC pipe, but you can see pretty much the same thing. We've got a T here, and this is for a uh, fire hydrant again, so we've got a valve. Um, see. I think there's other ones for the rest of it. That's a closer look at a 45 mega log. So there's actually there's two, two sets of bolts here. These lock down on the pipe, so uh, and they break off. There's actually a nut that's a bigger nut that starts out on top, and as they uh, crank it down and it tightens, it'll it'll actually break off, so they don't over tighten the pipe and uh, squeeze the pipe. So uh, those will actually break away as they tighten up the pipe, and then there's the bolts that actually pull it together. Do the bolts have to be stainless steel or anything to prevent the Um No. They they do they do have stainless steel bolts on uh, fire lines that are required to have stainless steel bolts, but the water mains don't have to be. And they also have to um, there's different codes for different set, uh, different cities, but they will paint the um, the fittings with like a tar to keep the bolts from rusting, and that's basically so they, they can take the take it apart later and not be sawing all these bolts off. That's another pipe, another thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's a picture of a joint restraint, which. Um, if you had a nine, if you had a 45 over here and you were restraining uh, the pipe back, this is what the next joint would look like. So same principle. There's a bolt here that tightens a collar around the pipe on both sides, and then you tighten the bolt between and it pulls it together. All right, here they're installing tracer wire. So you see the blue wire that's going on the top of the pipe. Um, that's installed um, pretty much on, on the public side more than the private side. Anywhere there's a public main, the 
they're required to put up tracer wire that way. If they're trying to find out where the pipe is later, they know exactly where it is. They can pull, they can go to the valve down here and the valve down here, hook a little uh, uh, clamp to it, and they'll basically put a charge through that wire, and they can know exactly where that pipe is. You have ductile iron pipe. It's very easy to locate in the ground with a metal detector. Yeah. You can see exactly where it is. PVC doesn't show up very well on metal detectors, so that's why they put this on there. They'll so between each valve, they'll put, uh, connect that wire, charge it up, so then the metal detector picks it up very easily. So you can easily locate where your water lines are after construction. And I, I was mentioning there's other uh, items that they use as far as tracing the, uh, or uh, identifying the pipe. That's a roll of tape that they actually put down as they're coming up above the pipe, as they're uh, filling it, back filling it. Um, they'll place some tracer tape here, and it'll actually say water line, potable water, or it'll say sanitary sewer, and it'll be the color of the pipe. And that's just for the contractor, whoever's digging, if they don't have locates, hey, there's a pipe down here somewhere. So, yeah, so they have a backhoe, they're excavating. That should be at least a foot or so above the pipe, so that should get picked up first. When they dump the pile of dirt they just dug up and they see that tape in there, they say, oh no, there's a utility here, and hopefully they stop digging and don't bust the pipe. Anyone know what that is? Okay. Alright, so yeah, it's dewatering. Do I need to explain? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so what they do here is they'll they'll actually um, usually they do this before they're installing a water main or you know any kind of utility below ground where the water table is going to affect uh, their installation and they'll come through and run a header pipe here and um, they'll jet these uh, smaller pipes which are called well points into the ground and there's slots in the pipe all running all the way down the pipe um, and so they'll push it down into the ground hook a pump to the end of this uh, header pipe and draw the water out of the ground. So, um, and they'll usually leave that running. There's the, there's a, there's a pump right there and uh, there's the water that's coming out. Um, so they'll pump that out of the ground and then they'll come back in, you know, a week or two or however long it takes for them to draw the water. Pull out the well points, excavate down, install their pipe in a nice dry, hopefully dry uh, area, and they can get their compaction around the pipe um, and get their installation done. So that's just one of the things the contractor use um, to help their installation because otherwise, you know, they're not going to get compaction around the pipe. They're going to be settling and a lot of other issues. So uh, that's one of the things they use. Um, all right, so this is something we actually have to think about a lot uh, when, we're in, when we're designing things, is uh, how deep the pipes are being installed. So if you think about it, if you're looking at this uh, pretty good sized hole here, um, you'll notice that the banks actually go pretty wide on both sides of this, this hole. So if you were to design a site that had a water main that ran right down your property, it's going to be kind of tough if it was if it's a deep line uh, to install that without impacting your neighboring site. Um, so we kind of have to think about that on two two levels. One, can do we have to install it that deep, and what kind of structures are nearby um, that are going to be affected? And two, it can it actually be installed if there isn't a way around it. Um, so. Okay. Good, good. It's basically an OSHA regulation. Uh, if you're working below the ground, you've got to make sure that you pull enough soil away so it doesn't collapse in on top of the person who's at the bottom of the hole working. Um, so if you, say, had a pipe that was six feet deep, you can't just dig a hole that's five feet wide and six feet deep because the person down in there, if the banks collapse, it's going to be very hard to get them out, and then they die before you rescue them. So you've got to cut it back at an angle. So you have 
let's say the bottom of that pit is five feet deep so you can get down there and work, might be like five feet wide. Uh, if it's, again, if it's six feet deep, generally you're going to want to be at least a one-to-one -one slope. So if you're six feet down, six feet at a one-to-one -one slope, you're going to have to be 36 feet to one side, 36 feet to the other side. So you've got a 72-foot wide trench to put in this pipe. And if you're too close to the property line, you can't do that because you can't work on someone else's piece of property. So what this thing does is it puts in a steel box that you can work in without fear of the sides collapsing on you. That way, maybe the bottom five feet can be flush, and then it's only the top two feet where you got to go at that slope. So instead of being 72 <coughs> feet wide, it now may only be, uh, what would that be? Third, third, no. Top two, four, ten feet wide, maybe. So they can also actually um, stack these on top of each other. They've got uh, braces and extensions they can do as well. Um, another thing they can do is they can, I don't think we have any pictures of that, but they can drive a uh, sheet pile in the ground, temporary sheet piling, and they'll drive that in the ground, excavate, keep driving it down until they get to the depth they need, and then once they're done installing it, they can pull the sheet piling back out. Right. Yeah, the main thing is, it's expensive. This is a make you thing because you start laying out your site, you go to put in your water lines and sewer lines and even storm lines. Think about where you're putting the mines and how deep they are and can you physically do that construction on the property? Do you have enough room between the property line and where that line is? Because uh, when you're just drawing it on a sheet of paper, if you don't think about how it actually gets constructed, you may have some serious problems when the contractor gets out there and starts trying to install it. If you know this is there and you budget for it, that's great. This is not as cheap to do as you know digging a huge giant trench, but it's easier and safer, especially if you got if you have a secure, <coughs> say, temporary construction easements from an adjoining property, which may cost you a fortune or you may not be able to get buried. So. Um, okay. Any questions on that? Typically, are you going to run them under your roadways? Yeah. In the right of way, yes. If you're working for the county or something, yeah. But when you're doing it on your property, you've got to get a water line and a sewer line and a storm line all the way to the back of your property to serve the apartments. And maybe just depending on where it is, let's say the building. Back in this case, you can see the building right there. Uh, this may have only this may have been there because the contractor started the building earlier than they should have and didn't want to undermine the foundation, so they had to do this sort of system to install the um, utilities. And it may very well be that. Normally, the contractor, the first thing they're going to focus on, especially on a big building like this, is getting the pad built getting the concrete in the port and start working on the building because it may take them you know, the majority of construction to do the building uh, and they don't think about the utilities at first and it may be that he knows there's a deep line running to the building and it may have been cheaper for him to install that line first but scheduling wise he may not have had time because once that line's installed you've got to have city inspectors come out and make sure you're short you the bedding is compacted properly, and then you backfill over it properly. Then you've got to run testing, pressure testing, and make sure the line is properly installed. Then you've got to do bacteriological testing to prove that the line is not contaminated. Then you've got to submit it to DEP with those results, and they say, yes, that line is cleared for service. You can turn it on. That could take could have finished building the whole place. By <laughs> that could have taken you know, a month to go through that process, and the contractor is not going to wait a month to start their building. So they may have elected to put this in because of where it is next to the building. Now, the engineer, if they've known about that process, should have probably tried to push the line further away from the building. But I don't know what's over here. Maybe there's a, another site constraint, and that's just where it had to be. So some of that's where knowing how things get constructed and how your site lays out helps you possibly save some money and do value engineering as you're designing your site. Um, and you, you had asked about uh, putting the lines under the roads. Most of the time you're trying to avoid putting lines under the roads. 
just in case there is uh, a leak or something, you know, something that effect. It's more expensive to excavate the road, tear, you know, tear that up, dig down, figure out what the problem is, and then build it back. So, um, generally, try and avoid putting the utilities underneath the, any kind of you know, structure if you, know, if you can. If you have now, when you're laying your water lines, you're going to have to connect to the county. Do you tap into their line, or do they tap it and then you connect from there? Uh, it varies. Uh, some cities or counties require that they do the tap. Uh, most of the time, you're required to do it, and they'll just supervise it. Okay. So that's usually the way it works. Uh, I might have a picture of that. Uh, okay, so here's actually, yeah, here's a picture of a uh, fire department connection that we were talking about. Um, and that's where the fire truck would come in, hook up to that, and, and most of the time that's going to be a dry line um, to the building. And then once it gets to the building, it'll have that, the chemical oozing. Um, but that's where the fire truck would hook up, and then this is where the backflows would be installed. It looks like it might be. The lines have been installed, but the backflows have not been connected at that point. All right. But here are some backflows. Okay, yeah. So, all right, so th back to your question. The water comes, you know, the main water comes right through here. Um, and then there's this bypass meter right here. So that's pretty much if there's any small amount of water coming through it, uh, it's going to catch that through here. This is uh, some, it's a gate valve. It's called an OSMY valve, um, but it's pretty much a gate valve. Um, that's the check valve in the middle here. It's got uh, kind of a swing deal here. And that's, that's going to prevent the water from going back and forth between the public and the private side. Um, this right here, that line right there, that's polyethylene pipe. And that's what you would see on your smaller water services, like uh, most of the services that you run to your house or to you know the smaller one, one and a half inch, two inch pipelines. That's what that is. They, they also have, they used to use copper uh, for that as well, but... You don't see too much copper lines anymore, uh, mainly polyethylene or PVC. Polyethylene is the same thing, I guess. I don't know what's called it, plenty pipe? Like, um, it's, or is it, no, it, it in? yeah, it's, it's very similar to that. Yeah, yeah. different material, but it's, it's very similar to that plenty pipe uh, that they use for irrigation. Yeah, it's, it's thick though, it's, I mean, it's pretty thick pipe. So why are there two backflow preventers here? Have two different water sources. You have reclaimed water or local water. Fire department has one. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. The big one is for the fire department. Yeah. That's serving the uh, basically the sprinkler system in the building. And the smaller <coughs> one is your domestic water supply. Uh, obviously, for uh, drinking water, you don't need as massive a supply of water. It doesn't have to be as high pressure, so you use a smaller pipe. The fire flow, you've got a huge demand to put out a fire in the building, so it's going to be a much larger pipe, so you have fewer losses, and you can put more water through it. So that's the backflow preventer for the fire system, and that's the backflow preventer for the, the lower one is for the domestic water. So each building is going to have two of these. It's going to have a fire backflow preventer and a water backflow preventer. Assuming it's sprinkler. Yes. Um, yeah, if it's a house, you yeah. don't have a sprinkler system in those houses, but anything that's going to hold on. Any commercial building you pretty much built today over a certain size is going to have a sprinkler. Any it's apartment an building is going to have it. Yeah. Any office building is going to have it. So is there no flow that goes through the fire uh, system unless there's a fire? Pretty much, yeah. Pretty much uh, this one's not going to have a lot of flow through it. Uh, they'll come in, check it every now and then as far as... Uh, the actual backflow, they, they're required to check those annually, um, make sure there's no leaks and they, they run properly. That way, you know, it could be leaking back 
that pressure. So uh, they have to have those checked. But in general, there's not going to be any flow coming through those. And we'll draw a little sketch later, but from this back flow preventer, which is the fire side, all the way to the building, because that can be, if there's ever a fire, they're going to pump, connect the fire hydrant to a fire truck to the FEC. It can get pressurized, so it's required to be a higher pressure class. So in this design, anything from that backflow preventer all the way to the building is going to be DR14, whereas the rest of the system would be DR18, which is diameter ratio, assuming it's PVC. It's sort of inverse. The smaller it is, the thicker the pipe is, and the more pressure it can withhold. So DR14 is actually a stronger pipe than DR18. And because it can be pumped up through the fire trucks, you basically need it from the building to this backflow preventer, the higher pressure class. The reason it stops here is because as soon as the fire truck comes in and starts pressurizing it, your pressure in the your side is much greater than out in the public side, so that check valve will trip automatically and the pressure stops there and you're not pressurizing the rest of the system. So we'll just put draw a sketch later. There, you can tell about this one. This just shows you the extremes we'll have to go to sometimes for fire protection. This is a site I did in Deltona. Uh, we could not get enough, based on our fire uh, demands, we could not, from the city's public system, get enough volume or pressure of water to meet the fire rating for the building. So we actually installed a small tank, I think it's about 150,000 gallons. <laughs> and then a pump house right next to it to pump up the water from the tank into the building so we could meet the fire demand. So, not, you don't do it a lot, but it does happen. And in fact, in, we have an office in Puerto Rico, and a lot of their large retail developments, you pretty much are going to help on doing this sort of system just because they have not as reliable of a, and robust of a water system as you see in the states. This isn't as common, but in some rural areas, you're going to see something like this for your commercial building. But yes, that was, a nice little addition to the cost of the project. So. <laughs> uh, Jim, go back real quick. So you see this big cul-de-sac here? That's for truck turnarounds. So when you're planning your site, that's how big some of these truck turnaround areas can get. I mean, it looks pretty large on the picture. It is. So. That's a busted water line. <laughs> Just to show you there's a lot of pressure. Uh, yeah, that pretty much shows you a lot of pressure in the system. And um, a lot of times when you, you'll see on the news that you have the boiled water notice, 99% um, of the time it's a contractor working on something and broke something or didn't install something quite correct. Uh, and the water was exposed to contamination of some sort. So, uh, a lot of times when this happens, the city comes out and starts running around trying to find valves to shut things off and figure out where their system is and where it's not. Because uh, sometimes they don't know. Because, it, it, you know, a lot of these systems have been in for quite a long time. And they don't record the information as well back then as they do now. Uh, so, a lot of times, you know, you have to go to the guy that's been there the longest to find out where the valve is that's close by. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, that's just a picture of a uh, pressurized line. I've actually seen, I've seen fire hydrants shoot out of the ground before uh, just because they, you know, they forgot to tighten a couple bolts and when they're doing their pressure test to see if everything works correctly, that's when they found out it didn't. <laughs> and yeah, it, it would literally, I've seen a fire hydrant shoot that far out of the ground. So it's, it can be dangerous um, you know, if you're not paying attention. Let's see, okay, so this is a, uh, this is a uh, bore and jack, or a jack and bore, whichever you prefer. Uh, what they do here is, so, um, if you've got a line that's, 
question. Okay. So if you've got a line that's maybe across the road uh, that you need to access, a lot of times the city or the county is not going to allow you, so if this is the road, the city or the county is not going to allow you to open the road up and close the road for a certain amount of time to dig down, block traffic, reroute traffic. A lot of times you can't do that. Um, it just, there's not a way to reroute traffic. Or the city or county just says, no, we don't want to do it. So, uh, so in, in, your, in your case, so let's say, theoretically, we were to tell you there's a water line on 50 that can serve your project, except that it's on the south side of State Road 50. In order for you to get to that water, you've got to do a connection underneath State Road 50. They're not going to not gonna let you dig a hole in the road to make the connection. So you've got to do something to get from the north side of the road to the south side of the road. And this is one of the options. Um, this one is used uh, usually if it has to be a more precise um, elevation or on larger size pipes. Um, and, and it has to be basically accessible from both sides with a large area. Because as you can see here, they dig down. Uh, what well, they'll install these tracks right here, and this machine is basically a big auger. Uh, so they'll big, they'll dig a pit on uh, on one side, and then they'll go to the other side and dig another pit, and that'll be the receiving end, and this will be the drill end. And uh, yeah, so it's basically a big motor with an auger hooked into it, and they they'll connect to this pipe right here. You can see actually they're pulling through cable when they go, um, so that'll be either a locate or some other uh, some other type of water line or a, a electrical. Um, so inside that pipe, there's actually an auger that drills as there as this machine moves along these tracks. Uh, it kind of cores through the ground and pulls out the dirt and. Uh, at the same time, they're using this machine to drive in a casing pipe. Um, and that casing pipe is going to be the carrier for your pipe. So that's not actually the pipe that you're going to hook to. Uh, you're going to put your pipe inside that. Um, we don't have any other pictures. Of that. Okay. So there'll be your ductile iron pipe or your PVC pipe will uh, be inside that, and they've got all kinds of configurations on how many pipes you can put in with spacers and make sure they're, uh, they don't sag or anything like that. But uh, once this big casing pipe is in, they'll remove all this, and then you'll you know, slide your pipe through this hole to the other side. Uh, so that's one way of doing it. Another way is, well, this is that, is there, is there another picture? Yeah, so. This is okay. directional drill. Yeah, so this is a directional drill. Um, this is used a little, uh, a little more often on uh, on water lines when you don't want to dig up something, um, but you don't need the precision that you need with a jack and bore. Uh, what they'll do here is they've got a machine, a similar machine that's kind of got an auger a uh, bit on the end of it, and It'll go down at an angle, so if it was coming on the side, a side view, come down at an angle below the ground, run as far as you want it, and then they'll bring it up the other side. And they do that basically, um, yeah, this is the aug, that's actually the bit they put on after they drill. So they've got these rods, and when they want to change direction, they just adjust the top, and it changes the pressure on the others, and it kind of, you know, they can move move it based on these uh, rods. Every time they get to another rod, they screw in another one and keep going. So once they drill the rod through, they put this bit on the end of it, and they pull the pipe back through the hole that they just drilled. So these rods kind of keep the hole open, and they use, uh, they use some material, uh, real slimy stuff called bentonite, and uh, you don't want to get it on you. It's nasty stuff, but it's real slimy and it makes the hole real slick, and uh, they're able to pull back this pipe back through the hole. And this is the HDPE pipe that I was talking about that they um, that they use that doesn't have any fittings on it, so it doesn't it's not going to get caught on anything. And they'll actually fuse that uh, pipe together in joints so that they can.
put together a real long run and pull it all at the same time. Yeah, there's it coming through. And you can see that there's actually the wires right here that are being pulled with it for the tracer wires. Um, that's the slimy stuff that they put in the hole. And they've got a little pumper truck here um, pumping it out because they're pumping the whole time that they're dragging it through. So when it gets to the other end, there's a lot of that stuff at the other end that comes with it. So they'll they'll uh, use that pumper truck to kind of clean that up. So you can see the pit they had to dig for this thing is a lot smaller than the pit you have to dig for this one. Right. So right. if you're limited in space, a directional drill is a better option, but it, you don't get as fine a control as you do with a jack and board. But if space is limited, you may be forced to do a directional drill to get out of the road. The other problem with directional drills that you have to worry about, uh, depending on the depth, if it's a directional drill, you're basically creating a hole and then pulling the pipe through. So there's going to be some kind of voids. And depending on the depth, um, if it's deep enough, you're not going to have an issue because it's going to kind of consolidate and you'll never notice it at the surface. If it's closer to the surface, you might get some settling. Uh, so there are requirements there as far as what size pipe it is uh, and how deep it is. So your alternative is a jack, is a jack and bore where pretty much the soil, there's no soil loss because you're drilling and sliding that casing pipe at the same time. That dirt has nowhere to go but actually out. So worst case, you would actually get some heave um, versus voids where you get the settling. So you'll notice when you drive down roads and things, uh, some of the older roads, you feel a little dips. That's where a pipe went across. Um, all right, so this is pretty much some of the finer points in your design um, of your water system. We're going to go, once you guys calculate your sanitary sewer demands, um, you're going to use these pretty much three factors for estimating your flow. We've got the average daily flow, um, your maximum da daily flow, which is going to be your average times two, and your peak hour, which is going to be your average times four. Um, anybody take a guess why we use factors of safety on these? Or what would cause that kind of? Well, if everybody turns on their sink all at once, it's going to drop that pressure. It's going to, you have to maintain a certain pressure. Now. Yeah, yeah. So when you think about it, there are peak demand times, peak hours. Um, when something's going to get used, and it's different for different uses. So if you're at your house, you're going to have a high demand in the morning, high demand when you get home, but in the middle of the day, nobody's going to be using your water. In a commercial setting, it's pretty much the opposite. Nobody's going to be there when it's closed. So during the day, you're going to get your more demand, and at night, not so much. Office setting. Uh, Again, during the day, you're going to get your uses pretty much throughout the day. Night, not so much. So to offset that kind of stuff, we use these factors um, based on the average daily flow. This is what you're going to have to do for your system is you're going to first estimate your flow. Um, it's a little bit backwards here because of the way we're presenting it. Uh, we have on the resources directory of the web courses site, there is a publication called uh, 64D6. That is a FDEP publication uh, for the design of sanitary systems. They have in there pretty much the state's accepted sewer generation rates for various uses. So based on your uses, you can go into 6046 and calculate how much sewer demand is created by the development you'll be putting in. It'll be a sewer demand for the commercial uses, for the residential uses, and office uses. They all generate at a different rate. Um, so you're going to have to use 6046 to calculate that. Then you can go and back calculate the water demand because if you think about it, Whatever you're generating sewer is going to be somehow related to how much water you're generating. 
What do you think is going to be higher? Your sewer generation rate or your water generation rate, or are they the same? Water. Sewer. Sewer is what? Water. Sewer is going to be higher. Water is higher. Water is higher. Sewer is actually lower than your water generation rate because not everything that comes out of your sink goes down the sewer drain. Some of it goes for watering stuff. Some of it's losses in the system. Um, you drink it and dispose of it other places. <laughs> but not all of it, not every drop of water that goes out of the faucet goes down the drain. So generally speaking, water demand is higher than sewer demand. And the generally, does anyone know what the generally accepted factor of, or factor is? It varies depending on the state. Yes, it does. I say around here, sewer demand is about 90% of water demand is a good rule of thumb around here for this sort of development, what you're going to be doing here. So the first thing you're going to do in estimating how big of a water line you need is calculate your flow, which you're going to do by calculating your sewer demand. Uh, so go ahead. All right, the next thing you're going to do, um, when you're sizing your pipes, can we say on here? Okay, I think we say on the other one. We've got some uh, minimum sizes on the... Uh, well, I'll, we'll, we'll go over later. Right. Yeah, we'll go over later. But it's gonna you're gonna have some minimum sizes, and once you kind of establish those, um, then you're going to start setting up your calculations in WaterCAD. And these are the two general uh, numbers that you want to see: maximum velocity is seven feet per second. Um, anybody want to guess why you don't want anything higher than that? Yeah, right. Yeah, so you get too much force in there, you're going to start causing problems. Uh, and sometimes it's on the on the water mains you're worried about where the 90s and the fittings that you're, talking, that you're installing are, but also some of the smaller pipes don't have as much um, as you know, the fittings, compression fittings and whatnot, so they tend to leak before your your larger water mains do. So um, so that's the reason why you have a maximum. Uh, I think we've got a guideline is five feet per second. Oh, we have um, And then the fire flow, like we said before, your minimum you're going to have two fire hydrants on your site. Uh, and on the design, we're just going to say that you have to put them at the farthest point from the site <laughs> or from the uh, connection. So it's basically where the water would be the, um, this for you have the least pressure amount. Yeah, this is all for, what, what, uh, for your modeling. Um, the requirement is going to be 1,250 gallons per minute on the fire hydrants. And that is combined. So if you have two hydrants, you could have the maximum coming through a fire hydrant is 1,000 gallons a minute. So you could have one that's 1,000, one that's 250, or you have two, two that are 625. Um, so, but in general, 1,250 gallons per minute. That requirement um, changes a little bit for certain municipalities, but in general, that's set by the NFPA. Um, so 1,250 is where you guys are going to have to calculate for in your fire. Um, with a minimum of 20 PSI. So you're saying we don't even need to do new department for calculations or anything? Just you're going to have to do them. That's going to be in your, in your water CAD. Uh, so when you do your demands for your of uh, each building, you're going to have your hydrants in that loop, and they're going to have demands on those at least 1,250 pounds. Uh, oh, okay, wait, wait. Sorry, max day plus fire flow. Yeah, so this is you're going to be design condition for your site. 
So you're going to have a max day, and then you're going to have a, an average daily close. So I guess simplifying it a little bit is you're going to have to show for your system, you've got your apartments, you've got your office building, you've got your retail building. You're going to have to figure out on your site where is the worst case scenario as far as water pressure in your system. Logically speaking, it's going to be the most distant point from the, um, the water main out in the right of way. So it may vary slightly based on bins and whatnot, but generally speaking, the furthest distance, so in your case, if the apartments are in the back, probably the building <laughs> furthest from the right of way is the one that's going to have the least pressure by the time you run your pipes from, say, Route 50 back to that building. So what you're going to have to do is for that worst case building, show that you can get a fire flow of 1250 gallons per minute at a pressure of 20 PSI. At that location. At that location, it's going to have to have 1250 gallons per minute uh, at 20 PSI while it's at the design system, design condition of that building has its own fire demand and is fire flow. I mean the max day demand and the fire flow. So you're going to go through calculate the water demand. You're going to model the system with whatever you determined up here as the maximum daily flow for the site. That's the domestic demand. And on top of it, you're going to put on the fire demand at that one building that's furthest from the right of way and show that your system meets the conditions of 1250 gallons per minute at 20 PSI for that worst case building. Does that make sense? Even though we're splitting, even though we can split the flow between the two fire hydrants? Well, the fire hydrants are where the demand is coming, basically so how you're like getting it there. So you're going to have to, the purpose of the fire hydrants is they're what's sort of providing the 1250 gallons per minute to the building. Okay. However, the most the fire hydrant can pass is a thousand gallons per minute, so you're going to have to model two fire hydrants adjacent to the building in order to get that demand. See what I'm saying? Sort of. In order to get the 1250 gallons per minute, that's required. That's, that's, that's required. required. You need at least two, two fire hydrants, hydrants because okay. the most flow of fire hydrant can pass is a thousand gallons per minute. So in order to get 1250. If the max coming out of a hydrant is a thousand, you need one plus a little bit more. Yes. So you can model when you're doing your model, you can assume one fire hydrant is flowing at a thousand gallons per minute, another fire hydrant is flowing at two fifty. You can throw each at six twenty five, whatever it needs to be. That's for the modeling purposes. The real site, you're going to have more than two fire hydrants, but what you're modeling in WaterCAD, it's going to be the entire water system with all the buildings pulling the domestic demand. And then for the furthest building, it's going to be that building pulling its domestic demand plus this 1250 coming from the two adjacent fire hydrants. And those adjacent fire hydrants that you want to supply. Yes. And the other one that the rest of the site, you don't have to model any other fire hydrant on the site, just the two closest to that building. Okay. If you can meet the fire demand there, you'll meet it in other places where there's less friction loss. Yes. Is there flow through the fire service and sprinkler system aside from the fire hydrants we Not in our modeling. Okay. Uh, because really, when you think about it, like we were talking about, a fire truck's going to come in and hook up to those hydrants and pressurize the system. That's just additional pressure. What's going to happen? Has to, right, has to be good. What's going to happen is, in the building catches on fire before the fire trucks get there, the heat's going to set these things off, and they're going to start functioning just at the whatever, at whatever the standard pressure is in that, uh, just coming straight from the water. But that's probably not enough to put out a major fire. So the fire trucks come in, they hook up to the fire hydrants, and they're now supplying the massive pressure, which is this 1250 gallon per minute. Okay, so we can neglect flows through sprinklers. Right. You don't have to worry about any kind of fire flow through <clears throat> the buildings. All we're worried about is the domestic, the potable water lines, and the two hydrants. And you only have to model one of your buildings on fire. It's sort of a 
It's not the most worst case scenario, but it's sort of unlikely that multiple buildings on your site are going to be burning down at the exact same time. If you had to design your system to have every building on fire, it would be pretty cost prohibitive and not very realistic. So you just do one building, which is the worst case building, you model that one meeting the fire demand. All the others just have the regular domestic. The other thing that's going to happen if there actually is that kind of circumstance is somebody's going to call the plant and tell them, hey, we got a big fire over here, turn the pumps on. So they're going to they're going to turn on the backup pumps and increase the pressure just to help that out too. So uh, they've also got automatic you know, detection on it. If they do lose pressure, that you know the pumps will kick in. So, so um, all right, so this is just a a uh, model that we had done previously in our, this is actually a hydrant uh, model, there's no services on this, uh, but as you can see, this would be where our water supply is, so this would be like State Road 50s out here. All right, you're going to model the connection point here, I'll show you how to do that in a second. You're going to model that connection point, uh, you're going to run your water main, and at some point, you're going to try and loop this system. Um, this isn't necessarily the best option, um, but you know, there's not always ways to do multiple connections, that kind of thing. So you've got one connection here. You can have two if you want. You can have a supply here, and you know, if this extended all the way out to the road, have another supply here, and then your entire system would be looped. Um, Sometimes, again, it's not as cost prohibitive. Um, there, you, most places are not going to want you, unless it's a really large uh, complex, you're, you're not going to make two taps on a water main. Um, so, but in general, you want to try and keep that system as best you can. It also cuts down on the size of the pipes that you need. And whatnot. So, um, so you've got your water main here. Um, we've got a loop system here. We've also got kind of a dead end line over here. Um, so in general, you kind of try and avoid that stuff, but as long as, say, the end of this line is a service to a building or something like that, then you can pretty much be sure that that water between this um, connection is going to be used on a fairly frequent basis. So you're always going to have that water running through there. Um, if it's, say, a fire hydrant on the end of that, then that water is probably not going to be used all that often. So a lot of times... Um, actually, for maintenance, cities will, cities and counties will come through and actually flow test these hydrants and clean out the system. And uh, I don't know, sometimes you'll notice like your water gets a little bit different color, but usually it's some kind of moving water that's forcing that to break free. And if you ever actually open a fire hydrant, it's nasty looking water. <laughs> but uh, so that's the system, and we've got these little. Um, pipe runs here that, that are connected to our hydrants. Um, go to the next picture. Yeah, so this is a pipe run. You've got, you're going to model a joint. I actually go to the, the one at the All right, so here's how you're going to model your uh, water supply. You're going to model as a reservoir. Um, that's pretty much it. Think of this as your water tank that you've got uh, flowing gravity, so it's always going to have a constant pressure on it. Um, so when you set that up, you're going to set up an elevation that matches uh, the pressure that we are going to tell you what the pressure is at, at your connection. Uh, would be where our water main is. Yeah, yeah, that's going to be out, out on 50. Um, we're going to tell you what the pressure is on, on the line. Uh, sometimes you'll have to do, uh, actually you have to go out there and test the lines hook up to the hydrants and do a flow test to get what pressures are exactly where you are and what time, what day, you know, that kind of thing. Sometimes you have to do multiple tests, but in general, um, you're going to have to find that information out. We're going to tell you for this design, but uh, most of the time you actually have to find that information out on your, on your own. <coughs> um, so when you're going to set this up as a reservoir, you're going to set your elevation on it and Basically match that to get your pressure that we give you. I think we, I think we say it's 
50 psi or something like that. So yeah, it'll it'll be on there. Uh, so once you get that set up, you can start setting up your the rest of your system. All right, so you're going to install joints and hydrants and pipes, or junctions, sorry. Uh, the junctions can be, again, like a T of this or 90 or 45, anything like that. Uh, they can also be modeled as, uh, you can put a demand on these, so you don't actually have to do like a little stub out for every building. Uh, depending on how it's set up, you can use these as the demand, uh, whichever you want. It just depends on how far that distance is to the building. So if you got a main line, in a building way up here, then yeah, you've got to model that a couple hundred feet there. But if it's, you know, the building's right here, then you're not going to have that much loss between those two. So uh, that's going to be where you put your demand for your services to the buildings. Your pipe, you're going to install. You're going to have to tell it what the distance is, what kind of pipe it is, um, diameter of pipe. There will be a C value for... Hayes and Williams, and that's going to be based on the material. I think it actually tell it automatically fixes it for you once you tell it what type of material. So as long as you know whether you're installing ductile iron or PVC. There were those PDFs that came along, but. Um, Over here, go to West Forces, files, utility data. There's this water data sheet, which is here, and here's the design information you're just getting at. And what was the, the other one you said for calculating the sewer demand? 6486. Yeah. If you come in here into CAC resources, very first one, 6486, that's a PDP publication. You can do a search online if you want. Search 6486, you can pull it up, but we've downloaded it before you, it's right there. Um, but that's in the tech resources folder. If you're doing anything in the state of Florida, they're pretty much going to assume you're using those, those values that DEP has established. Uh, unless you've got a specialized water study you've done for your project and you want to you know, sign a seal and submit it in, then they'll accept it. But it'll raise questions and you know, additional review, and it's easier just to assume the values that DEP has said. Here's the value to assume for the state. So. And that's where those are published at 6046. Okay, but here you go. This don't, is. Don't use the county, whatever. Requirement for uh, oh yeah the yeah fees. yeah we've had that happen once before new sixty forty six I've seen students back calculate if you go into the Orange County website they have uh, impact fee calculations so you can determine what the impact fee is going to be for your water demand which you'll actually have to do which you will have to do as part of the OPC but they will have a what they call an ERU which stands for equivalent residential unit. So you can go in and do a calculation, determine how many ERUs are, and back that into how many gallons per day they're estimating. But that is, that's sort of, you're doing it based off of a county estimate for cap fee calculation, not on an actual engineering design of the water generated by your uses. So make sure you use 6046 to calculate water demand and sewer demand. Later on, you're going to take this water and sewer demand you calculate from 6486, compute the number of ERUs for your development, and calculate a water impact fee and sewer impact fee when you do the cost estimate. But that's a separate process. Okay. All right, so I think we pretty much went through most of these. Um, you're going to assume the existing water mains a 12-inch PVC, uh, 50 PSI available pressure. Um, fire flow, you've got 1,250 combined. Design conditions, that's going to be your maximum daily that you calculate plus your fire flow, which is a 1,250. Backflow devices at every 
building, and assuming ninety two percent. Yeah. So this we already pretty much covered most of this, but that's in the job or in the. Um, what are your uh, typical pressure in the residence? Uh, available. Well, I think we require a minimum of a minimum of twenty, but uh, I mean, is it usually well, a lot higher than that? Um, in general, so yeah, so normally it depends on how close you are to the plant. Right. right, right. Um, so the closer you are, the better pressures you get. In general, you're going to have more than that. Um, that's just kind of a safety precaution that you're going to get it's at like least. Very very end of the line. Yeah, I mean. Usually what I'll see when I do fire flow tests, uh, they can get upwards of 65, 70 PSI. Like right next to the plant. Yeah. Um, yeah, usually the low end is going to be the 30, 35. I just got small up with this too, but what was this? Okay, so this is just, uh, so that, okay. All right, so when you guys turn turn in your um, the report, we say you can use the uh, WaterCAD model as your uh, layout. Make sure it's actually legible because when you print it out, you you'll you can't even tell, but there are actually numbers around this whole thing where all the joints are, uh, where all the junctions are, and there's actually letters where the hydrants are, but you can't read them. So just make sure you you can go through label by hand however you want to do it. Just make sure they're legible. So like this one, this one we actually turned in. We actually went through and said, "Here's your hydrants." So, um, so you're gonna have to submit that as part of your report. You don't need like the perimeter of the site for the actual. Um, not for the modeling portion. For the modeling portion, as long as it is pretty much the same. When you when you do your mod when you do the model you're going to tell it how how far it is so you're going to draw it pretty similar to what your layout is on the site. Mm -hmm. um, I don't need to see where the buildings are and everything on on that particular uh, in the report. When you get to your plans, yeah, we're going to need to see where the water goes in relation to the buildings. Uh, actually, are we going to go to the water? Okay, so this is a hydrant report. So um, this is a detailed report. You don't have to go through this much detail, but it's going to tell you um, available. There's your pressures. Uh, this one might be a little bit. Oh. Oh, yeah, here's your fire flow available. So this one, it'll tell you this information as long as, as, long as you give us a report that shows your fire flow and um, the PSI. Uh, that's a detailed report. I think that was the only one I had. So, yeah, so as long as you have that, stuff, that hydrant report in your... Uh, Report the memo that you submit. That's good, and then you'll have the the other items that we outlined as the junction uh, and the pipe report. So uh, those are listed in the memo. And this again, it's just to make sure when you turn your tech memo, you cover yeah. these things. Yeah, so when you do your water demand, there's gonna your your calculations right here, you're gonna need to show based on the sewer how you get your average daily flow for water. Uh, and then your max day calculation using the um, factors plus the fire flow. Uh, and then when you do your model, you're gonna have the node uh, report, the pipe size report, uh, and then the sketch that I was talking about, labeled. Um, on the plan for a fire service, how far do you want to design it? Like just to the FTC and a point of service? Or? Um, sorry, Sean, you mean like 
actual You're not doing sprinkler design or anything in the building. It's just, uh, yeah. So just pretty much five foot outside the building, you can stop your pipe. Uh, and then as long as you have a backflow for your fire supply and for your potable water supply. Um, do you want to get the plan? We can go over there. Yeah, we did that. We pulled this up before. Uh, but just to refresh you guys. Uh, so when you're doing your water layout, you notice we don't have any water lines going into the building. Uh, you know, we're trying pretty much to try and keep the shortest shortest distance to things, so you don't want to go all, all the way around here. But um, we didn't put anything under this retail space here because we know eventually something's going to get built there, uh, even though this is just now parcel. So uh, you got water lines running around the buildings, and then you've got your service lines that connect uh, to the building. Uh, so this is a hydrant connection here. So this one they made us connect. You got the one water line on the right side here uh, that connects out to the main road. Yeah, there's your connection. It comes in and they actually had us loop this entire building. So we've got this water line that loops the building. And then what's the road back here? Again, they wanted a loop system even though it was one building, but just in case. Well, something breaks back here, water can get around the other side. If they shut the valve off right here and down here to work on something here, you can still get water the other way around the building. Or if something breaks out here, <coughs> it, it seems a little ridiculous for a single building, but this was a big building and they wanted us to move this. So now for your future space, are you leaving a lot of like uh, gap piping? Yes, yeah, this does have. There is, I think in this case, because there's a water line right along the right of way. And uh -huh. so there's a plug. This connects straight out here from the right of way. And there was. Right here? Yeah. So you got a water line running here, and then there's your connection point for this parcel right out here. Yeah. So, and, and again, this is going to be planned for some kind of usage with a demand on it, but. Yes. Um, can water services enter from behind the retail, like from the back of the retail center? Okay, sure. So typically they enter from the rear. Yeah, most of the time they, they go from the rear, but uh, some of the cities, <laughs> some of the cities uh, require you to put the water meters and backflows in the front of the buildings. Uh, that way they can access the meters and read them. They don't want to have to go look for them. So that kind of plays into the accessibility. Um, and the convenience factor. They don't want their guys um, digging around for their meters. So sometimes, most of the time, they require you to have at least the meter uh, out by the right away or a, an accessible road. Okay. Yes. So on this one, you your water line does go underneath <clears throat> your uh, your parking lot, then. Yes. Yeah. So pretty much, I mean, when you're running through a parking lot, you can't really avoid not putting it. Um, and you try to avoid putting it under landscaped islands just because there's trees that go in those and uh, tree roots don't really go well with some of the smaller water lines that kind of, um, kind of get in the way. So, um, yeah, so in, in this kind of circumstance, yeah, you're going to put it running under the road. But if you had, like up here, we're running parallel to the road, but we're not under uh, the the main road. All right, and then this one, where is the... The back of the water. That's a tree strap. Uh, Oh, 
Okay, here, let's. That's the back door right there. Yeah, so here's a water main. You've got a backflow preventer. It actually says it right here. Our reduced pressure zone, backflow preventer meter. Do the sketch on the fire department connection and back to the <laughs> yeah. All right. So what we're getting at is uh, you've got a water line, say, out here in the state right-of-way, and you've got your, your big building sitting here. Um, I'm going to make the assumption for ease of use here that I can put the backflow preventer on my property. So we will typically, you'll have, let's say we connect down here, you know, behind the building, come back up, and reconnect. So I've got two taps, two taps to the uh, water system. And then I need to get, you know, a fire connection and a backflow and a domestic connection into this building. So what you will typically do is you will um, pull off of this main here, you'll come over, draw that very poorly. <coughs> So this would be a backflow preventer that comes into the building. So what's happening is water comes in off of this tap. You've got these double detector check valves, and then it goes into the building. And there will be somewhere from the building that ties into the fire sprinkler system. It can either be directly attached to the building or um, part Right next to the roadway. Or back here in the roadway. The, most places in Florida want the FDC away from the building because if the building's on fire, you don't want to drive off and walk right up to the base of the building and have to connect a hose to it. You'd rather it be remote from the building. So there will be somewhere in here a line that comes out of the building and has that little, the two little valves at an angle that you can connect to. Then there is Somewhere separate from this system, you're going to have a fire hydrant. So what happens is the fire truck pulls up. He will connect his hose from here, this, from the fire hydrant, into the pump, which is the truck. And then it goes to this hose. So water is coming from this system into this FTC and pumping up. It's very important that this fire hydrant is located on a line past this backflow preventer because what happens is as they start pumping from the hydrant into the building through the FTC, this pressure increases. As that pressure increases, it's going to come back up this line, hit this backflow preventer, and then basically stop. So at that point, you're not pressurizing the rest of the system. If you, say, put a fire hydrant right here and try to connect it into this FTC, what's going to happen is as you pump into this FTC and pull from this, you just got this circular motion where you're pumping from the same thing you're pumping into. So make sure when you do your line, you've got an FTC go kind of straight at the building, you've got a fire hydrant that is not on the same line as the um, backflow preventer. And in this situation, this line from the building to the FPC is going to be DR14. Now the problem is occasionally the city will say, we want to be able to check this FDC. We don't want it behind the building because that's hard for us to reach. So you can't put this FTC sitting here. You're going to have to put your, your backflow preventer up here near the right of way. So you'll come off up here with your double detector check valve. You then have to run this line all the way 
into the building. And unfortunately, this is all DR14, which is the more expensive line. And when you have situations like this, you see occasionally someone says, okay, if I didn't have this loop system here, let's say my domestic was just comes from here into the building, I've got this fire department line that comes from the right of way into the back of the building. Why don't I just put my fire hydrant here and pump up the building from this? The problem is, is this fire hydrant is coming off of this backflow preventer, so then you have the problem with you've got a circular flow and you don't actually have a chance to pressurize anything. So if you ever have a situation like this where the F, the Double detective check valve is actually out of the right of way. You do have to have another line that comes in back here if the only thing it is to do is put a fire hydrant for the fire department to connect to. And this, this, F, this fire hydrant has to be within, let's say, about 200 feet most of the fire department connection, which will come, say, straight from the building. So are your fire hydrant, or your, your backflow preventers, are those typically next to the roadway? Or at the end it of depends. The facilities? Orange County, in reality, Orange County, I think, makes you put them out by the right way. So not feeling like through all. Okay. Not every place. Uh, it depends on where you are. A lot of places will let you put it. I've done a lot of stuff in the city of Sanford. The city of Sanford doesn't care. You can put it back behind the building. Um, the reason that comes in handy is because this DR14 line is much more expensive than a DR18 line. So instead of having to have this high pressure class pipe all the way back here, I only need it for that short distance. Yeah. Uh, what are the rules on just seeing off of your domestic? Or what? So like it, right there, instead of doing two tapping saddles. Yeah, you could have. This could have been the same thing that was for the domestic, but domestic, you may still have the meter out here too. Right. So can you like instead of running a fire line and a water line to back your building, if you're allowed to have it back to the building, can you just have your water line run back there and then tee off the back there and have a fire line? If you're allowed to have your backflow back there. Right. Okay. Someone else had a question? No. Never mind. It gets a little complicated sometimes thinking about it. It's That's a little more detailed than right. my, my question is, I, well, if you put your truck right here and then you, you connect to the building, but there's a water, water is on the loop. What prevents the water to go into that? When you put the, say you put your fire truck right here, yes. it's actually not. We're going to run into it. Yeah. Here's my fire truck. So I've got a fire hydrant right here, which is its own system. So you go from the fire hydrant into the truck. From the truck into the FDC. So now you've got this giant pump here is pressurizing the building. Then as it starts pressurizing it, you're right, this line here will start pressurizing all the way out to the right of way. That's why it has to be DR14 because it's a much higher pressure than it normally experiences. But once it hits the back preventer, it can't go further into the system. And this this is pulling from this line, so as the truck is pulling the water you know, from the right of way into the building, this will start pressurizing as well. However, it gets here and it stops, so it can't complete the circle. So, and what about the, the one on the right side? This isn't connected to this line. Oh, all right. So this is one separate line goes straight into the building. This is another line that will loop the building. It's probably more detail that you're going to have to show in your plan. You need to show a line that gets down here and then two connections into the building 
I'm not going to make you do the fire system demand, the fire system design. You're not going to design the fire, you know, fire sprinklers. But just sort of think about where the backflow preventers are. If you're modeling your backflow preventers out at the right of way, you just need to make sure that you've got DR8 or DR14 for this portion of the system where it pressurizes. The rest of it can be DR18. And if you have this scenario, you don't want fire hydrants on that fire line. In fact, that's, that's the mistake people normally think. It's because this is called the fire line and this is just called the water main. They think, oh, I'll put the fire hydrant on the fire line because it's a fire line. But if you do that, you create those circuits, your short circuits you're trying to put out. You don't have to go through this level of detail. It's more of a gets you exposed to it, so you can start thinking about it when you see these on planes. Any other questions on what you're going to be doing and how to get it done? No, I'm good, man. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Ask questions. Go, go. Uh, WaterCat is available in the in the labs. If you don't want. Actually, do you have access to put it on your own machines as a student license, or do you have to go into the lab here? Um, you might be able to get it as a student license. No, I've tried doing that for uh, the summer. Yeah. You have to go to the lab? So, you go to the lab, if you can't get it to run, print it out, bring it in, show us. Jeremy has it on his laptop, if I remember to bring it next week, and we can help try to walk you through it. Uh, if you get really stuck. <laughs> is all the modeling done to scale? Like, you gotta get it does have to be drawn to the right lane because one of the losses is friction loss, which is going to be based on the lane. Is that a close estimate of the pipelines? Yeah. It doesn't have to be to the inch, but it has to be fairly accurate. All right, uh, we do have the quizzes to hand back. I was thinking we were going to get a quiz. I want that.